Hello, my name is Jeff Wagner, and the next little while we're going to be taking a look at Kenny Effects. As a visual effects artist, um, it's important that we can create more compelling uh, tests, simulations, and incorporating characters more and more is becoming an important part of the work that we need to deliver. And with Kenny Effects, it makes it so easy to integrate a character into our production tests, as well as expanding forward and building out really expressive motion and as we all know any any character brings a tremendous amount of appeal to all of the work that we do and from that we're going to take a look at kenny effects as a houdini generalist and effects specialist there is no doubt in my mind that you need to utilize kenny effects in your work houdini 18.5 finally has sop based rigging with this vast character building toolkit available in sops Houdini brings new opportunities to procedurally rig, skin, and deform all geometry. We've been missing a couple key things in Houdini over the years. First class path deformer and direct access to kinematic joints as general deformers in a geometry context. We now have both. Geometry operators or SOPs have proven to be a flexible and simple way of giving the animator, rigger, TD, an accessible procedural platform to do impressive work, whether it's character-related work from muscles and feathers to seamless secondary motion on top of flesh hair, fur, props, and more. One area of ongoing research within Kinney Effects is the evolving world of using VOP networks for constraints. This is a familiar workflow to those artists used to, let's say, ice graphs in other applications. And as we know, once you have VOPs, you can wrangle VEX code. This offers you the ability to write your VEX constraints using VEX code, a common environment to thousands of Houdini users. Exposing VEX rigging code along with Python for Kinney effects gives a familiar environment to let's say Maya riggers who are comfortable with writing code to support rigs and pipelines. Leading up to Kinney effects, we had key enterprise users building up rig tooling and VEX wrangles and VOPs to great effect. Performance wise, it was impressive but with holes only side effects could fill. This VEX approach to rigging still relied on wrapping up rigs using object-based digital assets with clumsy editable nodes uh, provided for customization. It wasn't quite there. Ultimately, rigs based on objects have performance issues, but the real disadvantage with object-based rigs is that they are inherently non-procedural. You can't dynamically build a hierarchy of bones and then procedurally manipulate the hierarchy without destroying and repairing, rebuilding the object rigs. Nodes, the object nodes just proved to be quite difficult to manage in pipelines. The focus for this first Kinney effects release is on the base foundational architecture. Create a tool set that allows us to import rigs using industry standard joints instead of bones with their predefined lengths local space transforms forcing expensive cracking to world space. And then there is all the baggage overhead from all the node parameters. Use points as joints. Use polygon curves to define skeletons. Build out all the constraints in a single location. With kit effects inside of SOPs, it makes it much more accessible and easy to finally bring in first class animation inside of our geometry context. So let's get on with it. So you're a proficient Houdini user who wants to get into Kinney Effects. Um, what I'd say is it's a great tool set for introducing any sort of motion characters. And with a small library of motion files on a few different characters, you can create a really nice suite of test characters to test anything from fire to flip to vellum to whatever you want. But it's it's a good idea to see how we can start. Where do you start? The answer is, why don't you start with a final rig as well? So you can go um, from this particular example on our content library, uh, which is Eric, our test dummy introduced in 18.5. And uh, it's a Kitty FX rig using Mixamo motion. It's the nervous motion. And we simply just add some vellum simulation on top of the antennae. Um, this is an idealized rig. I would 
build this differently myself, but it doesn't matter because the architecture for doing motion kit bashing is here. And so let's take a look how we can go from this to this, which is a thriller dance. Um, so both of the both of the motion files are Mixamo. They both have the same architecture, so we can take advantage of the motion retargeting that we built into this rig. So let's have a look and see how we set this up. So the first place we want to start out is with the content library, and that's under the get content library. And we'll scroll down here. We can see that there's the FBX Eric rig um, that we that we use for a lot of the work that we do. And then there's some rigs that were built on top of the tutorials that we released at 18.5, one of the, the, antenna volume, the, the antenna vellum simulation. We also have a KineFX jump rope and also another example that shows how you do train adaption, all with the same rig. But the idea is to download uh, KineFX antenna vellum simulation. And what you end up is something like this. So here's a file explorer of all the files that I that you download with it, along with going to the Mixamo website. And what you're looking for is three motion files. You're looking for a Thriller, um, Thriller 2, Part 2 FBX. You're also looking for a Mixamo file called Nervously Looking Around. And then third, you need to get the T-Pose FBX. And if we take a look at the Mixamo website, um, You create a user login. In this case, I'm logged in as RDW. And from here, you can search for those motion files, plus a whole bunch of other library of motion files. For um, um, They have a lot that are for personal use um, that really lets you get in. As an aside, there's also Carnegie Mellon. And they have a whole bunch of motion files that you can download, thousands of motion files. and. Luca Pateraccia, uh, one of the, my colleagues at SideFX, uh, fantastic TD, has actually, if I go to the tutorial section under KineFX, so if you search for all tutorials that are based on KineFX, you'll see that um, Luca's uploaded a really nice uh, tutorial, a, a long series tutorial on, first of all, how to download the CME Motion Capture Database. He builds um, a really nice tool to do that and then uses all the motion files to kit bash together hundreds of different motion files. And here's the retargeting lesson. Um, and this is using our new uh, format for, uh, for, for learning. So you can actually create a proper learning portal in here. Advanced users, new users, doesn't matter. It's a great way to, uh, to see um, uh, all the different uh, tutorials that we're starting to build out as well. And you can see that there's five tutorials in this series. One's an introduction, then there's a manual retarget, then there's a PDG retarget using the PDG graph to automatically retarget motion. If you've seen Louis, Louis Cruel's video, or the games video that he did earlier in the year, yeah, this is in the same flavor. As a matter of fact, Luca picked up that work and carried it much, much further. And then he does some smoothing clip, clips, and then he does an agent from rig. So he even introduces some crowds at the end, Luca is uh, I would consider him to be a crowd expert as well. So he was able to take all of this and make agents out of it. So definitely take a look at this um, to see about getting more rich motion fibers. But back to the exercise at hand. So this is the file that we're gonna start out with. This is the file that you get from, from the content library. And we're gonna dive, I'm gonna move my display flag onto the retarget node and dive inside of this. And this is a really basic rig setup. You can see many tutorials online. They essentially have the exact same uh, setup moving forward. So you start off with um, with your geometry. In this case, it's Eric. We have that geometry available for you. You can download from the content library. It's just an FBX file off of disk. And um, on the right-hand side, we have um, two motion files. We have uh, that uh, nervously looking around FBX file from, from Mixamo. And we also have the T-Pose that you grab from Mixamo as well. Pretty much every file will have the same T-Pose. And um, there's this really interesting node here that we should actually take a look at. Um, I'm gonna open up the spreadsheet on this. 
So what the rig stash pose does is it adds a rest attribute, a four by four transform rest attribute. So if I say um, hide all attributes and just show, first of all, show you the transform attribute, which is, as we saw, um, is, is ubiquitous to all the different joints. So basically what makes a joint is a point and a transform attribute. And um, we also, so the rig stash pose actually creates a rest transform as well, which is a four by four matrix. And it holds the rest position of the rig. And many of the nodes use that rest position to refer to as they do their work. And if you're coming from other softwares, rest position is basically the bind to pose, uh, bind to pose in this particular uh, situation. So the we, we stash, and basically it computes the rest transforms for us. Um, and then we use another node called the rig match pose. And what this does is it takes two disparate rigs. In this case, we have the Eric rig. And then we have, which is, uh, if I put a null in here, you can quickly see this uh, rig. Um, so that's the Eric rig. And let me open up, and I'm always doing this. Uh, there's uh, the rig tree. So if we take a look at the rig tree, right mouse and expand subtree, we can see here that this is the Eric rig. Um, and you'll also see if I wire this into the, that's the rest rig and that's the animated rig. They're pretty much identical. Uh, slight differences, different controllers, maybe different parenting. As long as the namespace is the same, the, the bone to form will do the right thing. And that's the one thing that's a bit frustrating about it. If you're in here, you got all this motion, you're all set up and go, why am I not seeing any motion? And the answer is because in this particular file, we've moved the, the bone, the, the actual bone deform operator into the vellum setup, but we can actually create a new bone deform right here and place that down. And we can wire that up and the three inputs. And of course the left input is the skin. In this case, it's bound, it's already bind, bound to the bones. Middle input is your, your bind pose or rest position, what we call, and then the right is your animated skeleton. So we can actually see the bone deform. Now we can play forward. And now we can see our nervous motion being applied. Pretty straightforward. And how this is done is we have the rig match pose, which is, and you'll notice that this particular rig match pose was done in such a way that the proportions, like you see many examples where you try and get the points exact. I found if you just have the right proportions and the right um, directionality, you don't necessarily have to have them live all on top. Although that is more of an advanced um, technique when you start doing this a lot more, or you're lazy because you only move as little as possible to get it to work. Either way, um, this is where you align in this case, the target skeleton, so you can move any of these joints around and you can um, you can position them such that to try and match as close as possible to the target pose. And that's targeting it to the rest pose, by the way. And um, then we have map points, which basically you just simply click and you just click the joints together to basically make associations. And this uses a multi-lister or a list of of um, multi-list of all the joints that are retargeted. And you only have to do this once, once if you have a family of motion coming in. And then uh, we have a separate one for just mapping the fingers because they're fussy, you can do that. Notice how you, it's procedural, so you can divide and conquer. It doesn't matter at this point in time, it's just adding um, attributes to drive the whole, um, the whole uh, rebinding. Now, when you're doing it this approach, um, you need to crack the IK transforms into rotates and back and forth. So, and that's what full body IK does. It takes the, the position of the two rigs using one as a driver into the second, and then it uses uh, full body IK to do the retargeting and all the, and, and all the really heavy lifting and to make the, the whole thing work. So these, these, um, for these three operators, rig match pose, match points, and full body IK, it's pretty much all you need to get one rig, as long as they're roughly the same one rig um, to map into another, uh, to have the joints of one rig drive the road joints of the other. In other words, this just becomes like a controller rig on top of this rig, and this just manages the namespace and the, tr and the transforms.
and the full body IK cracks the trans, you know, takes the rotates, does the IK, and then spits back out, rotates. Now we have a, uh, we also have an FK transfer in here, um, which is set up just to transfer some of the mappings of the fingers into the, and then the skeleton blend, which is used to blend the two together. And notice by having the rig tree, you can actually see, um, many times if you don't have the rig tree up, you don't actually see what you're working on. Um, but in this case, you can easily see that there's the left hand root and the hand right uh, root and all of the children of those two uh, locations in the rig are, are being affected. And then finally, we have this antennae subnet, which was just a subnet used to build the antennae, get it ready for the vellum solver, which these three operators farm out to that other object to do the bone transform. But we're doing it up here. So now we want to just have some fun. So I'm going to grab this FK and I'm going to drag a copy over here. I'm going to keep the nervous around. And it's as simple as this. If you want to remap different motion, just apply your different family of motion. And um, now let's go back to our bone to form. And there we go. So any motion library you have of the same family, you just apply it to your character. And it's that simple. Um, and so that means if you got a character that if you have the same character with swimming motion or with uh, motion there that it's jumping or running um, or or or, um, or any sort of motion. But let's say you want to create you want to mix two different motion together. So in this particular case, um, you want to take the um, this is the thriller. So let's call this thriller. And this one over here, let's call it uh, nervous. And just so we have this note when we start working with motion clips, as we would do in chops, but in kinney effects, we create what are called sequence clips. So let's create a sequence clip um, motion. Let's actually create a motion clip. And we can do this um, at any place we want. We can actually do it um, before or after the rigs dash post. It really doesn't matter. We can do this motion clip. And this turns it into a motion clip. And what a motion clip is, is if I take a look and middle mouse on it, you can see that there's 454 pack geos. If I select uh, a primitive, you can see that, um, and I'll just delete that and delete isolate it. You can see that that's one pack primitive. It's just a snapshot in time. And if we take a look at the spreadsheet on this, we can see that um, there's a time attribute on it. So basically it's a pack primitive with a time attribute on it. And that time attribute indicates uh, where this particular pack motion piece of geometry lives within the entire sequence. So I'll just uh, move that off to the side. And there's your motion clip. And then what we can do is we can do a motion retime and motion clip retime, for instance. Let's say we wanted this clip to start at a bit of a later date. Let's say we want to stagger, create some random motion in our rig. We can actually do a motion retime as well. And let's say animation start, let's say it started at uh, uh, frame 10 and uh, speed. Let's make it go a little bit faster. Let's say 1.5. And now if we move our display flag back to the bone to form and we play forward. Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, motion clips are in fact just ways of dealing with motion. What the rig deformant needs is actual the point cloud itself. Um, so many of our tools do not know how to read these motion clips. So you have to do a motion clip evaluation. So a motion clip evaluate is what gets us back to a place where a lot of the tools are happy. So this converts it back into instantaneous clips. Okay. And now we can go back to the bone to form and now we're happy again. So now we start a little bit later, start at the frame 10 and then we move forward. So that's motion clip, motion clip evaluate. But there's some other things we can do. We can take this motion clip. I'll click it over to here 
and we can extract our nervous motion. And we can do something even, even more interesting is motion clip. We don't have to clip the entire rig. We can actually do a uh, delete joint. And let's plop that down here. So delete joints, we can actually go in here either through um, selecting through the rig tree or selecting in the viewport, we can select. And I want to pick from the shoulders down. So that and shift that. So I want to pick and also select joints children. So that means it'll select all the other joints and I hit enter. Um, you can see it, it deletes the joints. And just like with the regular delete salt, we can actually turn this into an exclusion list by doing delete non-selected. So now we actually have our nervous arms. So how do we apply these nervous arms onto the rig? Um, we're really hoping that Mixamo is very consistent, which they are. They have fantastic motion, requires very little correction. The feet generally are rock solid on their captures. and. And it shows when you're starting to work with kit bashing a motion. And now we can take these two motion clips and we can actually put them together or, or mix them together. So um, we actually have this motion clip blend operator. And this allows us to clip two motion clips together. And we're going to ignore the read time for now. And we're going to put that into the motion clip evaluate. Now, now what's happening here is the motion clip blend is now uh, takes the first input as your base rig. And then the second input, it says, okay, fine. I'm going to now mix um, the joints from the right into the left. And it's going to kit bash the two motion together. And if I bypass and unbypass that, you can see that the arm motion for sure is now a lot different. And we can even blend this effect in. So let's frame, uh, let's, let's blend in the nervous motion, let's say at frame 10, uh, over from 10 to let's say frame 30, or maybe even faster, let's say frame six to frame 25. And um, then we can um, enable the blend and um, let's do blend out, um, let's say from frame 70 frame 85 or let's say frame 90 and the effect is one of the biases 0.5 so and then we can do so that'll actually mix all the blends together so okay and then we can do a motion clip evaluate and hmm, sometimes Yeah, sometimes it gets a little bit. Let's see what I've done wrong here. Start frame end 70, 90. Well, let's turn this off for now and let's see how this works. Yeah, motion could evaluate. So believe it or not, just deleting and undeleting the node actually fixed it for me. <laughs> so we're now back on track. Um, and then the motion clip evaluate should be happy. Yes, it is. And now we can go back to the bone to form. And now we start off with the thriller motion and then we'll blend in some of the arms. Then the quiet arms blend in. And then it goes back to the thriller motion. Now we can also do the same thing with the head. So um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, alt click this, drag a copy over and then under delete joints, let's now select the head. So I'm going to pick the neck joint and hit enter again. It's going to select the children and it's going to extract the motion clip. And then I'm going to do um, the motion clip blend. I'm actually just going to alt drag that out. And I'm just going to wire that in and wire this in. So now I got the first one going into the second one. And now I'm motion clipping the head in as well. And we can go back down to the bone to form. So we don't even have to 
um, take a look. And then the head slunches down because we're getting the nervous head. So really easy to take any of the motion that you have. Any motion files, kit bash them together. For instance, if you want to have a swinging, a swimming character, but then you want to have one of the arms uh, behave differently. As long as you've got some motion file of the different arms, you can just cut and paste it. So it really is quite easy uh, and very procedural to take all the motion and uh, basically drive anything you want. And let's see if we can create a field of Eric. So if we put down a grid and move that over here, and we're going to rotate this, we'll rotate this uh, 45 degrees. So it's a bit of an angle and I'm going to copy a bunch of Eric's to this grid. Um, let's do 45. and make it a bit bigger. And let's future, let's do five by five. And how do you copy? So we're just gonna use a copy to points. And just take a look, turn that off for now. So they all stand up right. There you go. Now you can have a field of dancing Eric's. Now in this case, you can use just regular geometry retime methods that we have available for doing crowds for forever. Or we could take Eric and turn him into an agent. We have uh, agent from, from skeleton that uh, Luca covers over in the tutorial. And then you can create a user crowd tools to create a whole flock, but this holds it very well. Just doing raw characters. And, or you could wrap this up into a for each loop, compile it. All these operators, I believe, are compile safe. And then you can, um, can you know, do some, some motion retiming on top of all of this and, and have lots of fun. You can even retime the arms differently than the body uh, and have all kinds. You can have the head and the arms and the body move a lot slower. Um, and yeah, have lots of fun with it. So very, very simple system. And this is, if this is your first try at using motion uh, kinney effects, just the kit bash, it's, it's a great tool set. You're taking advantage of this, this new architecture, and then you can use uh, any of these in your simulation tests or any of your, your effects work. And to recap, here are the steps that we did in the first exercise, um, which is a great first introduction to kinney effects where we can take some motion and apply it to the Eric rig and then uh, go to Mixamo and uh, download uh, the various motion files that we talked about before, which is the Thriller one, which comes with the rest pose as well as the nervous motion. And here are some great links uh, that I'd highly recommend for you to get up and running on using Kinney effects for motion retargeting. There's an introduction by Fianna Wong where she covers all the basics um, and gives you a few pointers along the way. And then there's Kinney Effects for Games by Luis Cruel. Now that one is uh, much more than for games, although he does cover Kinney Effects and all the different options with motion targeting. He even talks a bit about using the PDG to create a whole library of motion files. And then there's Henry Dean, who is one of the architects of many of the tools within Kinney Effects. And he's got a great tutorial that introduces Kinney Effects covering where KineFX is really applicable to, which is motion retargeting and motion retiming, uh, covering how to create sequences, sequence clips, basically what we covered, but a little bit more detail. And then there's um, um, Houdini KineFX 101 motion clips by Parker Coleman, uh, where he covers, it's a really nice, um, easy look at how to use a rig and do blending motion clip animations. And then finally, there's uh, retargeting animation using Kinney Effects by Bogdan Zykov, um, where he covers retargeting in a whole bunch of different uh, situations for, for a real work project that he's working on. And that was covered in a hive. Uh, great interview there, covers a lot of detail, including how to actually start fixing some of the motion files as well. So um, great, great introduction to Kinney Effects with all of these various uh, tutorials. It's time to take a look at 
what the atomic pieces are of Kinney effects, and it's pretty easy. What is a Kinney effects joint? It's basically a point, an adsop, a piece of geometry where you use an adsop to lead all the geometry but keep the points. Or you just draw some line segments or curves, and those points themselves become the joints. If we use an adsop, for instance, and connect two points together to create a primitive segment, or we use any wrangling or any other operator, such as a curve sop or a primitive, some, any sort of primitive operation that creates a primitive that connects those, that shares two points, or probably doesn't share, but it actually uses two points, um, will actually draw um, that joint. And then uh, we can convert that easily into skeleton. So a joint is basically just a point with a three by three transform matrix called transform. And that transform encodes translation, rotation, and scale. And it's world space. Um, so that's the big difference between what is uh, skeletons, what are bones inside of Houdini object space versus what a joint. So all joints are considered to be in, in world space. Having said that, we also construct a local space uh, three by three transform. And we can also add a rest transform four by four matrix, which is used by a lot of the operators to, to work with it. Great raid here. Um, we even talk about kin effects versus uh, kin effects skeletons versus object level skeletons. Um, you know, and we, we differentiate between the two. If you're an existing Houdini user, this is of sense. If you're new to Houdini, who cares? Um, creating skeletons. This is a great section on using the skeleton soft to create skeletons. We're going to take, take a look at two ways to build or two generic ways of building skeletons. One is through this node called the skeleton sop, and the other one is just take any points, and we're gonna be using the add sop in a bit. Lots of hotkeys when you're in this state for drawing out bones. This is really rapid bone creation, and because we're not creating objects as we click, um, it's immediate, and it is a lot of fun to do rigging. We finally made rigging easy, and that's a big deal. And also we talk about the skeleton, more of an example. And we'll take a look at this in the next exercise after this one. Uh, one other resource before we go forward is looking at uh, CG Wiki. Um, and there's a great section on, on Kinney effects as well. Um, a little more artist, artist wording um, and, and using some analogies. It's, a, it's also a great read. Read both websites and you should get a fairly good idea as to what we're dealing with, but hey, let's get into Houdini and actually do some work. So we're gonna start off with an ad sop. Um, I'm in the technical desktop and I'm gonna do a couple things before we start. Um, if you're in the build desktop, by the way, this is stowed over to the right and you'll notice there's a stow bar way over on the left-hand side, you can open that up. And you'll notice there's a tree view that can let you navigate wherever you wanna go inside of Houdini. In the plus button, let's add a new plane, pane type and go under animation. And under there, there's a uh, rig tree. So this is a new pane we added in 18.5 to actually visualize the joints and the skeleton hierarchy as we compose it. And we can see very quickly how when we create primitives to connect two points together, we're actually building a hierarchy. And we use the vertex order to determine naturally how these primitives connect together. So let's add a rig tree. You can see it's blank right now. So let's add a new geometry object and let's call this uh, skeleton joints and skeletons. And let's dive inside. Now, as I said, we're doing add sop. And if we, and I'm going to stow this for now on the very bottom and let's move this over a bit. And add sop, we can put down a rig doctor. And this is the first way in which you can create a joint. We can put down a rig doctor. And what this does, it will, um, let me move this over to here. Control click and let's move that over. And cause I'm using dual monitor. And then we can do that and we can see here that um, the rig doctor, uh, we need to do this one option down here, which is transformation. So we need to add that three by three transform. And as soon as we do that, we now have a joint. And we can put down a rig, uh, we can actually put a visualize rig node down. We can actually start seeing what it is that we have in, inside of our rig. And by the way, we actually have to add that point in the ad sop. There we go. 
and now we can go into here and we can scale our joint up. We can see here that we have, in fact, a joint. And, but there's nothing to it. We can see it's called point zero. So remember what I said, the second thing we can put down is a name operator, name SOP. And we can call this joint under bar zero. And um, so, and we actually have to name points, by the way. So it's kind of interesting if when, just an aside, if you're adding control geometry, you have to add the name on the primitive. But when we're dealing with uh, joints, the name has to be on the point attribute. That'll get you once in a while when you're first getting in there. Um, yeah, so if you're building skeletons from scratch using input points, you need to do that. So now that we got this down, we can actually take this and we can duplicate this three times. Or sorry, um, didn't want to do that. Uh, just hold down the Alt key and let's drag over uh, three different copies. And if we really wanted to, we could actually have renamed this, but in this case, um, let's actually see what happens when we have three name joints of the same. Um, but let's say the second add, we're gonna move it up. And the third add node, we're gonna move it up and then move it over. And we're gonna merge these two together. We're gonna merge these all three together. So we can take these, merge them together and display. And now we can see we've got joint zero, joint zero, joint zero. So let's actually call this joint one and joint two. And if you're an existing Houdini user, you're already going, okay, yeah, I know how to do this programmatically. Um, I can create a wrangle sop, or there's a whole bunch of different ways in which we can create this sort of a scenario where we have three joints. Um, so again, let's put the vis rig on the bottom of that. We actually have joints. We don't have a skeleton, but we have locators. And now, how do we create joints? There's uh, several different ways we can do that. One is bef um, we can actually put it right down here. We can put an add sop down, and we can forcefully um, not press this option. We want to keep the points and with all their attributes, but we can now go by group. And now we have a hierarchy. It's based on the vertex order. Remember what I said, um, the joint order is based on vertex order. And when we have branching, we add some ID metadata to allow us to do the parenting as well. Um, but now you can see here a joint and the rig tree. So this rig tree is really nice to have up and running all the time. And I can expand the subtree and you can see, sure enough, we got a joint hierarchy. And now we can do all kinds of interesting things with this. Um, for instance, we can build a really simple IK chain out of this. And uh, how we can do that is we can, we actually have this IK chains up, um, IK chains operator, and we can put that down. But we have to, we have two inputs here. We got required skeleton and mark required IK drivers. Now remember when we say skeleton, um, above the ad sop, we don't have skeleton. But with the ad sop, we do have a skeleton. There's a second way to create this data though. And it's a more interesting, it's, it's a more kin effects way is we actually have a reparent joints operator. And if you're used to doing regular rigging, you know, when you're in the viewport, you're always reparenting joints to create, um, you know, there's all the tricks we could do in objects and other applications where you're parenting things together uh, or reparenting things and moving things around to do really creative uh, parenting uh, setups. That's what reparent joints is all about. So we can actually say, um, let's actually move my display flag here. We can manually parent Let's say, oh, it's actually asking for the child first, and then we can do the parent. Now, the way I'm doing this is I press the arrow button, and because it's Houdini, we have to hit enter in the viewport. Now, we're gonna do one more, but this time we're gonna be using the rig tree to do this. And um, so I can press this, and I can actually say joint two. And the rig, we're still working out all the different kinks in the viewport. Houdini still is a little bit quirky if you're if you're newish to Houdini. You'd think you could hit enter in the rig tree and you can hear me pound away the enter. Or if you could hit enter in here, it doesn't work. It takes us into the operator. You have to hit enter with the cursor of the viewport. It's Houdini, so for now anyway. So if we press this and we now, and you'll notice here I've got a dual monitor, but off to the side, we were popping this thing up as well. So let's try this again. Um, again, it popped off off onto the second monitor. But now we can select joint two here, and now you have to put your cursor over the viewport and hit enter. And then we do parent one, 
And again, we can select a joint one and then hit enter in the viewport. There you go. That'll get you in the first little while. So remember to always put the cursor over the viewport when you hit enter. So there's repair joints. Same thing. Doesn't matter. We can put a switch operator in there. Um, there is no difference between the two. And to prove this, we can open up the spreadsheet and uh, move our display flag onto the switch. And then we can go to the switch. There is no difference. They're identical. That now opens up the door. Um, any freaking SOP inside of Houdini that can create geometry in such a way that we're aware of the vertex order uh, going into this thing can become an IK chain just by passing it through a rig doctor. And the test is just putting it on a vis rig. If you can see the joint with the IK chains through a vis rig, you're, you're, you're now set up to do some really cool, powerful stuff. You can rig, animate, deform anything you want. So the IK chains now has two options. It's got a required skeleton, sure. So we'll put that down on the switch. The second one is now looking for drivers. Now we have to build a control set of uh, points and do they have to be joints? Uh, most likely they should be. Could they be raw points? Oh, yes, you can. But the convention is that, and, and for future saving yourself, you absolutely can use points. Now we're gonna be using the reparent joints again. And reparent joints is, it's used like the Ginsu knife of, uh, of uh, hacking and slashing through rigs. We're gonna wire this also to the switch. And now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to remove all parenting and turn these into controllers. So the way we remove all parenting is um, we break the Houdini convention such that usually in every other operator or group fields, in group fields when we're doing selections, blank generally means everything. But we're breaking the convention here. You literally have to put a star now to select all your joints. And when we leave the parent null, it simply means we're now removing all the parenting information and we're going back into world space locations. Now you'll notice that the points do have a local transform, but they also have a world transform, which is to transform. And you can see all the attributes down below. I'll leave this idling away. So in case you, you want to take a look down there to see what's happening or also right mouse on here, expand the tree to see what's going on. So lots of tools to allow us to visualize what it is we're doing when we're working on. So we've got the repair joints and now we can wire this into the IK chains and we can start doing some work. Let's add an IK chain. It's adding for root, mid and tip name. So uh, two different, three to two different ways I know to do this. So the root name, um, you can drag and drop that doesn't work. So you have to go into here and let's select the viewport. This is easy enough and the middle name, and then we'll use the tip name and I'm, and I'm hitting enter in the viewport. Remember enter over here doesn't work. And I'm going to turn off. We don't want to twist in a goal, um, because we've actually supplied them as points. And we know that, um, because we actually grabbed the points from here they're going to have the same name as the, so when we're doing the reparent and we got them to nulls, we're going to the IK chains because they have the same name. If I click on here, you can see joint 012 and here joint 1012. But many times you might have low, uh, a control rig that has completely different names from the input. So in that case, when you're in the IK chains, you would have to turn this on and actually identify these all by name. But if we do match by name, it'll actually use the names on here to match with the names in here. Not necessarily the, the, what you want to do as well. And now we want to do blend all the way onto one. Uh, we set blend to zero. And so now we've got these joints here. Um, what we can do is we can put down a rig pose operator. Rig pose sop is how we interact with our control rig. Um, and if I put the IK display in the IK chains, we do the control rig and I select this joint and uh, actually hit escape and then enter um some it's houdini sorry escape and enter sometimes uh re rewakes the tool now i can do this and move it you'll notice that we don't do anything so except if we do blend so why isn't blend set to one I don't know, but i'm just letting you know set blend to one and now we can actually start interacting with this with this ik chain and we can see there's our look at 
and we can pull this away, you can pull it forward, pull it back. Now you can do all kinds of offset transforms and we have a whole bunch of tools or you can use Attribute Wrangle or you can use any SOP to work with this. But this is pretty much the architecture of KineFX. So that's it. Now what I've done is something pretty interesting. I'm an old school Houdini guy. I love the way that you can add some, some, some null objects in Houdini and wire them together inside of Houdini and create some really basic rigs. And I was really missing that when I was doing some technical rigging. So what I did is I started a, my own little, I've got thousands of assets. So I had another asset. So a few minutes in, I actually created an asset, which I will give to you. It's a work in progress, but I'm going to install asset library and I'm going to go to dollar hip and, um, Oh, actually, what I'm going to do here is let me save this first of all to my working directory, save as, and I got presentations in here, go to files. And I've got already, um, I've already got, um, let's actually call this, uh, can FX joints and skeletons. And let's call this demo and press accept. So now I'm in. My files. You can see there's an OTLs directory, and that's where I want to go next. So let's go assets, install uh, ins install asset library, and I'm going to go to my OTLs. Why do we call it OTLs? And let's go to hip, I because it kind of works out of the box. <laughs> that's why and HDA sometimes does it. Um, but anyway, I'm going to load these two assets in. So I've got two. Uh, I got a locator and an arrow primitive, and you'll see what these two do in a second. So press accept. And I want to install these. So let's place these two assets down before we forget. So there's the locator. Um, and the second one is my arrow asset. Uh, arrow primitive. I got a bunch of these. I do need to get these off to, to Paul to see whether or not he wants these assets to go inside of labs. I've built all the, actually this arrow primitive can actually do pretty much what you can do it in any application. You can put paint solid at arrows. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, but either way, I just want to use this as control geometry. Now, my locator asset is essentially this, um, but it does a couple of really cool things. So if I put my plus button on here, it basically encapsulates what it is we took a look at. Plus, it adds control geometry, and I can, trade the, I can change the control geometry. My general convention is green up the middle, and then red is, uh, red is right, and then, or pardon me, green, red is right, green is left, and blue is up the middle is what I usually do. So let's call this locator blue, and we can call this whatever we want. Uh, let's call this root. And we'll notice right in here, we got the rig tree. It sets up to root in the upper left. And now I can alt drag this one and uh, wire them together. And as soon as I do that and I move the second locator up, you can see that I'm already creating a joint. So this gives you the same relationship that you have in objects inside of Houdini, where if you wire two together, you actually uh, create a world and proper uh, correct world and uh, probably not doing the right thing to the local transfer. No, I'm not. So. Uh, fix this asset. You can see here this local transform should actually be inheriting the world. Oh, maybe it is. Let's try this. I don't know. So let's do this. Uh, no. So the local transform should actually be inheriting the roots world transform, which it is not. So, ah, I got it to do. But anyway, um, so, um, or maybe it is working. Let me be very careful on this local transform. One, zero, zero. Actually, it's working. What the hell am I talking about? One, zero, zero. So it's actually picking that up. So no, it's, uh, and I digress, it doesn't matter. Um, but there's my root and let's call this uh, mid and let's alt click this and call this tip. And so now I got my three locators in the tip. Let's move this up here and move it forward. Oh, I bypassed it. It's, but anyway, and we can change the colors of these as well. So you can make this green and make this one, let's say red. And you can now see that uh, we've cut the joints together. And uh, what I can also do is I can actually add an arrow primitive to the to the root. So in this root operator, we can now see that we get an arrow primitive associated with it. And uh, it, it actually adds it at the root position. So, oh, there's another to-do. <laughs> I should actually move that to the right position in the control geometry or else figure something out internally how to 
how to add that transform to it when we first do it. Anyways, um, but uh, you can you can scale your airframe. But anyway, there's a really cool option in here with just null, and we can do custom. Actually, I did do the right thing. So in here we can. So basically, I just exposed all the various options that we have available to us. Now there's a couple other users that have really built out locators. Um, I saw after the fact, and they they put all, everything in the kitchen sink in that thing. And I wanted to keep more to the spirit of what Houdini is. And and uh, um, you know, if you want to add some extra functionality. Just wire the locator in and a couple of the tools i've seen they actually build all the various different types of locators inside of the 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 object as well it's up to you what you want to do and now we've got this we can actually um put this into the certs um if i were to name these the same it would be very smart wouldn't it so there's joint one zero one and two so let's call this joint zero joint one and then joint two i'm sorry about this and now we can wire this into the switch and uh so if we go to the second input we're now using and uh, this is and the rig pose will now work on oh in the rig pose by the way it should still work but i'm going to clear it all and now i'm going to start moving this around and you can see now we can do whatever we want and we can move the tip and uh, if I actually move the display flag down there, you can now see that in the rig pose here, we can move any of our points and we're actually moving our skeleton, which is pretty cool. Obviously what I should do is create a new root and put the arrow primitive on the root, call it root, and then parent that to the joint one, joint one, two, and three. So we don't actually move that. In the example file I provide, I actually work that out. Um, but anyway, you get the idea. So what's the next step to this? is um is um, i'm sorry about that the next step to this is um we can now start building out more of the rig um we can uh do some really interesting things let's put down an l systems and in this l system move the display and flag we actually have some raw points and you can notice here if i um if i basically say expand subtree you can see that the, the L system SOP is doing exactly what it is we need to do on terms of providing primitives. So if I go in here, turn my lock off and let's select some primitives. If I select this line segment in here, you can see this is one IK chain and that could be another chain and this could be another chain and that could be another chain, another chain, another chain. So. We can see here that um, the tree, the L system tree already is a pretty interesting structure for us to use immediately as a, as a, as a control rig or as a, an IK, a, you know, as a skeleton rig. So let's have a look at what we need to do in order to turn this L system rig into um, a really cool KineFX type, type asset. So I'm um, going to move this back a bit and guess what we need to do, just a rig doctor. Because we notice we're missing the the world and locals transforms, which, as I said, is the second piece of the puzzle to actually building a skeleton. So initialize transforms. And now that we've done that, we actually have a first class rig. And the way remember what I said before, the way we can test that out is if we put down a vis rig, uh, visualize rig up, um, visualize rig operator, and can wire that down and we can actually see all of our joints in there so now let's set up a basic rig so we can push and pull this tree around so um, first thing we're going to do is uh, put down a uh, full body ik operator so we have a full body ik tool and it takes two inputs the skeleton and it also needs to take in um, a control rig so what we can do here is we can actually put down the delete joints and I'm going to wire it down over here and display flag. So what we want to do is we want to select those points that we want to basically work with the tree as a control rig. If I were smart, I'd actually be able to collect all the leaf points or, you know, a few points that I wanted to, but let's build a bit of a control rig. So I'm going to put the select operator down here and I'm going to select this point and select a few errant points. You can proceduralize this. So I'm holding down the shift key 
Well, I was actually accidentally holding down control, but if I hold down the shift key, I can grab some of these points. And let's grab the middle one here too and hit enter. And so now we have uh, to create an exclusion group. We basically just say delete non-selected. And so there's our, our, our points. Now this isn't, you know, if you wanted to keep the primitive uh, skeleton around, we could do that, but okay, we're gonna put down a uh, reparent. So we can down, put down our reparent joints. And in this case, again, uh, all the joints and we want to basically remove all the parenting. So now we have a basic control rig. And now we can wire that into the full body IK. Now, um, the magic note to put in here would be the rig pose. Rig pose is, okay, so what is the rig pose? It's exactly like what we have in the object space. You know, objects, we have uh, transform tools where you can pick objects and move them in the viewport. Uh, the portal into this is the rig pose. So it's a, completely different concept of what we is what we're doing in objects where we open uh, where you actually have to select the node to get the operation um, that's until we wrap this up into a digital asset and we promote all these up to the top then you can have a regular rig whether that's at the object level or in the SOP level you'll see that a few of our users inspired by Kenny effects and want to leapfrog us and start building rigs already the majority of uh, the users that I've seen with videos out there are building the rigs at the object level. You can build rigs at the SOP level as well. Um, but for now, if you want to play it safe, you could build the rigs in the object level. I tend to like to build them in SOPs to see how far we can push this. Uh, but the rig pose, uh, back to that. And now I can pick some, some points and move them around. And you notice that nothing's happening with the full body IK. So let's take a look at what's going on here. Um, First of all, we do want to pin the root of the tree. So what pin root does is it actually looks for the zero primitive. Where's primitive zero? It assumes that's the root, or at least the zero primitive coming from the skeleton. So you can prune the skeleton as well to get that pin root, then put a merge sop afterwards and, and you know, fuse the rigs together. So you can actually cut up these rigs into parts and use just regular sops to reconstruct them. But we actually want to basically, um, we can turn on compute uh, local transforms and uh, we can actually do match by attribute. And as soon as we do match by attribute, it's the same thing that we saw before, it'll now match by name. So that means if the name of this joint equals the name of that joint, we are now gonna get a full bind. Now I can go back to this rig pose and I can start uh, pushing, pulling these points around. Each one of these points can have a weight associated with it within the full body IK. So you can actually configure each joint and add different weights to it. Um, you can increase the number of iterations, which will, depending on how complex it is, it'll resolve faster. You can actually, and generally what you find out is as you increase the iterations, you want to increase the damping. And there's the tolerance as well. Tolerance I find is pretty good at the default. Um, you might want to set it to 0 0.001 if you want to have more accuracy, but at the cost of speed. But anyway, now you can go back to your rig pose and have fun. So how can you move these points? Any way you want. If you want to put some noise on here, you don't have to generally use a rig pose. You can do any sort of wrangling, noise operator, anything you want on these points. As a matter of fact, let's try putting down a jitter. I'm just doing this cold because I haven't practiced this. Uh, but I love to freewheel. So let's put this down after the rig pose. And we can actually put point jittering on here. And now we can uh, change the seed and we can do all kinds of things on here. We can put a mountain operator, put any sort of noise operator on there that you want. And we're doing this on top of the rig pose. Now we're introducing something interesting, uh, layers. Um, there's some interesting discussions about rigging and uh, you might hear the word ephemeral rigging, which is this whole concept of working with transitory rigs in a system where you have to cache every step in order to move forward, which is what you would have to do in Houdini and what you'd have to do in other applications. But in KineFX, we can stage or layer as many of these tools that we want. So order of operations is basically um, in the order in which you build up these different transforms. So here we have a rig pose on top of the point jitter. So, and, uh, and of course, uh, yeah, you can do whatever you want. You can add some slight little jittering. Um, and uh, you can use P-scale as well if it's present, which it is with L-system trees. So that's a basic setup using L-systems. 
Now, it wouldn't be complete if we actually didn't do a simple rig. So um, the documentation, our documentation covers rigging Flippy. So let's put down the test geometry. I call it, I call it Flippy, but uh, we have the rubber toy. And let's finally see how quickly we can actually add some bones. So I'm actually going to set the template flag. If you're new to, newish to Houdini, the template flag, welcome to softs. We only have a single display flag, even though we have all these loose operators, all these different leaves. Um, we're limited to only seeing one final display geometry, although we can turn templates on for anything that we want. So if you're somewhat newish to Houdini, that's what the template flag is for. So I'm actually setting this up. Now we saw using the add sop and connecting it together. The second way in which we can construct rigs is to put down, by the way, that you can use any geometry as we saw with the L system trees. Uh, we're going to use the skeleton sop. Now the skeleton sop does everything that we saw with my locator and, and I know the other options using the rig doctor. It will actually build things on the fly for you. So, and you'll notice that for some reason, my template, I like my template geometry would be shaded. For those of you who are newish to Houdini, just hit the D key on here. And you'll notice that there's an option to switch between uh, display options, but to control the display of template geometry, you can go in here and template model geometry. And you can set the view of your templated geometry. So I'm gonna do wireframe ghost. So there's a bit of a differentiation. Again, that's just the D key. Change your, uh, your your type of display, current, or template, which are the three basic modes in which we can work inside of it. Current is whatever node you have selected. The display flag would be the node with the display flag, and then there's the template model geometry. And uh, I just set that to wireframe ghost, which I think is the default. So now let's draw the skeleton. I'm gonna press space bar B, B as in Bob, to go to the quad view. And now I'm going to start drawing out my skeleton. I'm just changing my interface a bit here. And I'm going to go in the right-hand view. And there's a lot of videos on this talking about the various different options on the top here. Um, we can go view-based, which will fire ray into the scene. And when we fire the ray, we'll do nearest hit, farthest hit, and then we move the joint that we're creating in the middle of that. There's normal based, which is basically looking at the surface normal of the geometry freehand, which means just start sketching. And surface means you can draw joints on the surface. We're going to do view based. And we're going to use the right hand view. First thing we're going to do is put down a root. And then I'm just using the left mouse button click uh, my cog. And then I'm going to build uh, my shoulder joint. And you notice here as I'm snapping, because this geometry is perfectly symmetrical, we're actually putting these joints right on the grid. I could turn on my construction plane. Um, construction plane is different than the grid. The grid is just for visualization, but the construction plane, if I turn that on, it'll immediately change the behavior of all my snapping. It'll actually start drawing on that construction plane. And you can right mouse on here to see all the various different uh, options on there. But I'm not using that right now. In the next presentation, in the next segment, I will be using that construction plane to show you how to use that, by the way. Continuing on the right-hand view, I'm going to now start doing uh, the neck root, the neck joint, and then the head joint. And I'm going to use the middle mouse button to terminate it. Remember I showed you the help earlier on? Again, go to the Houdini um, drawing, you know, introduction to kidney effects, drawing skeletons in our help. We give you the full sheet of hotkeys that you can look at. Now I'm actually going to now just simply left mouse click on a new joint. And remember, I'm in this mode called create right up here in the top. And now I'm going to do the root for the jaw, and then I'm going to do a jawbone. And then I'm going to use the middle mouse button, complete that. And I'm going to continue on drawing here. I'm going to draw the root for my hip. And then I'm going to start drawing out the tail. And I'm going to use the middle mouse button. Now to draw the limbs or the legs, um, I'm going to actually use the top view. I kind of like that. So I'm going to start drawing from there. And let's draw the clavicle. And you can see here how I'm snapping all of this. And then let's draw one, two, three, middle mouse button. And again, draw from there. And uh, let's draw there, 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 and there. Middle mouse button, pretty easy. Now we're gonna mirror this. I could actually go in here and start renaming the joints within the skeleton sop, and I'll show you a bit of that. It's a bit tedious, so I can call this root. And uh, this is why the rig tree up all the time. I mean, even though the skeleton sop, you can pop up the rig tree, it shows up, and, but I like having this permanent here. And this, I'm gonna call this cog. 
center of gravity, obviously. And let's put this under uh, shoulder or um, shoulder root, whatever convention you want. And let's call this, um, actually, let's call this left underbar um, uh, arm root. And I'm just going to hit uh, uh, enter here. Now, if you're in the skeleton and you hit enter, it's like in drawing mode versus edit mode. You'll notice here in the modify, if I hit enter, enter completes and it puts you into modify and you can have the option called child compensate if you wish to just move the bones. And what that does is it resets all the, all the local positions and all of that for you. Whereas if you turn child compensate off, let me show you. So let's say you wanted to tweak the position of this one joint. If you have uh, child child compensate on off, you hit right mouse and show handle, and uh, I can tweak that bone back. You can see how we're moving everything. And if I turn, it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty straightforward. Child compensate. So, but anyway, uh, and uh, escape enter is my 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 way of just resetting things. But anyway, let's let's uh, call this um, so we can actually see the joints. Actually, that's not my left arm root. That's my neck root. And let's take a look at there. There's my there's my arm root, left arm uh, root, and this is going to be my left arm elbow, and and this is going to be my left arm wrist, and the final one is going to be my left arm wrist root and I'm just going to pause right now and then I'll pick up again uh, after I've renamed everything. So now I've renamed most of the rig. The last piece I didn't name is the tail. So we can actually select all three joints and right mouse on this. So you can right, right mouse on any of these entries within the rig tree and we can do a whole bunch of different work. So let's do a rename and this is sometimes fussy. Um, sometimes I have to hit, like hit the arrow button, hit backspace. I, I, this is a fussy thing sometimes. Um, shift and right mouse on there and do a rename. And I can call this tail. And tail underbar one, I just call it tail. And you can see it does tail, tail one, and tail two. It uses the vertex order to rename this. But now we got our rig. Um, so now we want to mirror this. And so let's do a mirror. Um, but there's a, there's two mirrors that we can look at. There's a rig mirror pose or in skeleton mirror. We want skeleton mirror because we're working with the skeleton right now. We're not doing any rigging or any posing. We want to do skeleton mirror. And so that allows us to mirror and it mirrors everything. You can see we've duplicated uh, all the middle spine as well. So remember in the object space, we're smart enough. The, that tool is quite evolved. The old, the, the old uh, tools, because we're creating bones, it's such a permanent operation every time you do a mirror or a duplicate or actually adding objects since once you create an object I mean that's the one thing that differentiates between this and object spaces objects are inherently not, the old rigging system and objects is not procedural given that Houdini everything is procedural whereas here now we have a procedural way of creating those joints um, so I'm basically going to just select these joints here and hit enter or I could put uh, name equals uh, L underbar star and I can grab everything that way as well. Actually, let's see if that works. I'm just going to alt drag a copy and then I'm just going to put L under bar star and that should pick if I'm consistent and I can just put L under bar star and that should grab everything as well. And uh, did that work? Um, I don't know. We'll find out. Actually, it did. There you go. And now there's a bit funkiness here. Um, we'll notice here that uh, we actually have, um, you can see there's left arm. Um, we actually have 28 points, whereas we started off with 20. So we effectively have done a mirror. But notice that sometimes the rig tree view will actually take a look at the input operator. And I'll show you that by just putting down a null. And we can wire this up together and we can move the display flag. And let's right mouse on this to expand the subtree. Um, so we still haven't done a successful mirror. So let's do uh, point mirror. Um, and the mirror plane one zero zero 
and attributes to mirror. So this should give us a mirror. And we do have a mirror. And you can see both are working just fine. And that's how you work away with your skeletons. Um, and the way you would you work that way. But what we can do, oh, pardon me, we actually have uh, nodes with the same name. So we want to say find tokens L underbar. And we want to replace them with R underbar. And uh, so that should give us everything. Let's expand subtree. And there we go. So now we have uh, left arm, right arm, left leg, right leg, right leg. Right. So it's all working just fine, um, how we want to work on that. And that covers the basics of, of joints working forward. As I said, I'll supply a file that's worked up a little bit beyond this, but this gives you a really good, strong idea as to what you can do with joints. Basically, anything you want. These are the ABCs. Uh, you find you'll be doing a lot of this work repeating at nauseum. So, yeah, have fun. Let's take a look at an example from Parker Coleman, um, another example on building skeleton rigs from, from scratch. And in this case, he builds it on top of Tommy, uh, one of our basic characters. And in here, he loads up the file and he shows you how to draw some basic skeletons. Um, and we've already taken a look at that. Um, he also has some nice time, time, time stamps on here so you can quickly jump to different parts of it. Uh, binding skin to skeleton using biharmonic capturing, capture layer paint, delta mush. Uh, but what we want to do is he's this is a quick and dirty rig for sure. And I actually built the file. You can access the, the file as well and have a look at it. And we're going to see how we can clean up the geometry, make the rotation angles a lot cleaner, and really work and finesse the rig so that it, um, it behaves uh, better when we're doing rotates. And we'll have a discussion about how I like to orient joints on rigs. So let's have a dive in at that. So we want to take a look at the documentation, um, working with skeletons, and that you can get in docs who do you need character can affects skeletons.html. And here's a really great uh, description of an introduction to can affect skeletons. You can get a similar overview of uh, IK skeletons from Tokaru, the Tokaru website. They cover similar things. This, I like the wording of this. It's to the point and very succinct, and it actually gets to what we've been discussing discussing about previously about what a joint and a polyline and a child is is basically um, you know built by these polylines and the vertex orders and then we have a whole bunch of tools on top of that to allow you to control and manipulate that what's interesting down here though is um, creating skeletons there's a whole bunch of hotkeys in here that are really nice to print out and, and paste on the side of your monitor as you start to draw skeletons. You can see that there's an awful lot of meta keys and hotkeys that really allow you to quickly um, get a little bit more accuracy in drawing your skeletons. Um, but the area that I want to have a look at is um, when we're cleaning up the various different joints, there's some really interesting options that we have available to us. So. Um, this is a really cool technique here that we're going to take a look at drawing a skeleton on the construction plane. So you can use construction plane orientated uh, to draw your bones on. Um, and also when we're uh, fixing construction, when we're fixing the geometry, there's really nice ways of cleaning up joints that we'll take a look at. Orientating joints is what we want to be interested in because this is what was going to consume us for the first little part. Um, and we'll take a look at the reorient joint stop again to see how we can automatically reorient joints. And we'll see how this sort of fails on a more complex rig. Um, this is meant more for simple branching structures such as trees or other um, mechanical rigging where, um, you know, it's a little bit more predictable in the way and simplified in the way that the joints are, are oriented. Um, but there's a really nice technique in here that we'll take a look at um, that allows you to reorienting, reorienting joints with orientation picking. So let's have a look at that now with the actual file and move it forward. So here's the Houdini file um, that I went through the tutorial. Not quite exact. I was, um, as I was following along, I started adding a few things here and there. Now I am always in the technical desktop, uh, but what I'm going to do where the tree view is, and if you're in the build desktop, you'll notice that this stow bar will be closed. So if you can open up that stow bar, that would be great. And then in here on the tree view plus, we're going to actually create 
under animation, we're going to create the, the rig tree. And that's just like what we've done for the rest of the examples. I always like having the rig tree up. And as we pick the various operators, for instance, the skeleton operator, we can he see here that one of the things that I deviated from Parker is as I was creating the joints, I actually renamed the joints with the skeleton. And you can do this. Uh, you can, there's a few different functions here. We can uh, select the joints from the rig and we can right mouse on these and we can do uh, rename, delete, copy as text, copy as vex expressions, expand the stuff. So there's a whole bunch of really cool tools you can do on here. But the rig tree comes alive um, with some states and some operators. For instance, the skeleton sop, the rig, uh, the rig tree really does uh, come in handy and has a lot of usefulness. Um, but for the rest of the time, you can actually see the what some of the operators are doing, such as uh, reparent uh, joints will. We'll, we'll start playing around with this. Some of the operators will, will change this as we go. So let's keep on going on that and leave that open. Um, so now um, we have our skeleton. And if I hit enter, we enter the state. And uh, there's a few different options that we can use on here. I can pick some of these joints on here. And as we saw before, we have child compensate. I have child compensate on now because I want to start uh, fixing some of the rotates on some of these joints. And if I right mouse on here, I can actually show the handle of this. I can actually um, right mouse on here and I can actually say display joint axes. And uh, let's actually turn the handle off for now. And I like, because I'm an old school Houdini guy, um, arm bends. Um, what I really want to see is the the red axis or the red rotate axis is usually the axis that I bend my arms with. Um, and then the Y is usually the complementary axis. And then the Z axis is always the axis that aims down the arm. It's just the way I like to rig. And uh, it doesn't matter uh, if we are importing any motion capture data. Rig orientation really doesn't matter um, in the actual solve. It's basically just the position of the joints relative to the skin that does the actual deforms. So these rotates are only meaningful if we are doing a rig inside of Houdini. Um, and again, if you follow the tutorial, you'll see how uh, Parker builds a lot of these things. He uses a skeleton blend to basically blend left and right, which is a pretty interesting technique, um, building a little bit of a rig so we can actually rotate between the two. And we can now see the joint axes are, are, are available to us in the entire um, interface as well. So let's set that to zero. And uh, I've got a switch over here that switches over to a different part of the rig, which basically just does a limb IK. And this is where um, you can you can build your IK rigs. So we actually have a reparent, we have a blast node. We, we blow away, as we saw before, you blow away the parts of the rig that you want to use as your armature. And then we reparent these joints. In this case, we remove all parenting. So we create a, a, bo a broken rig, essentially a broken rig, where these, these uh, locators are now free to go in space. And, uh, and you can do the same thing with an ad sop, by the way, just delete jump tree, but keep the points. Um, and then we can use the limb IK and it just uses the positions, um, to drive the various different limbs. In this case, we have, uh, four, four IK limbs that are being built from, uh, one is for the left hand and, uh, yeah. And we can set all that stuff up with the limb IK. And then we have IK chains. So the rig pose, this is where we use to move these locators around and then the IK chains follow along. Um, so let's get back to the original uh, skeleton. And uh, again, I wanna clean this up a bit here. So in that documentation that I showed you earlier, it gives you really tech, really nice technique for orientating the joints. Now, one of the things that might be confusing to you in Houdini is we have these two seemingly grids. Um, one is just a display grid. Um, snapping does work with this display grid, but as a construction tool, it's simply for display. And uh, we can right mouse on there. We can actually control rulers on grid points if we want them as well. So there's a lot of controls that we can have. I'm just going to have the main axes. The second icon below that is our actual construction plane. And as soon as we turn that on, we can right mouse on the construction plane. 
and it gives a whole different a whole bunch of different options and what we want to do is um, first of all I want to when I'm in here turn child compensate on and I want to select this elbow joint as I said before um, I want the that red axis to sort of go where the green so I want the red is in the rotate in the x direction um, that's the axis that I want to open and swing the arm with I just like using uh, rotates and X for, for arm swings and same with knee swings so what I want to do here is right mouse and unfortunately the T key for turning on the translate handle rotator scale um, doesn't work in this particular state so you have to basically right mouse on the joint and say show the handle and with child compensate on now I can actually rotate this bone until I, I just need it rough um, because the technique I'm going to show you from the documentation actually works quite well. And again, with the shoulder swing, I want to select this. And again, I want to turn the, the red axis going like that. And the green going forward and the, the z-axis will, will go along the bone. Uh, that's just fine. And let's take a look at the wrist. Same thing. I probably want my wrist to rotate this way. So I'm going to pick this and... Um, this one is a little bit off, so I just want to make it close. And where my wrist swing is going to be. That's close enough, I think. Good. Now, I'm going to select the three points. As we know, um, construction plane can flatten against three-point selections. And if I shift select these three points. Now I can right mouse on the construction plane. And there's an option in here that says Orient Construction Plane to Selection. So press that, and that will take the construction plane and fit it so that it passes through all these points. Now the next thing I want to do is, with all three points still selected, I can now right mouse on them, and I can say Snap Selection to Construction Plane. Now what this tool does in the skeleton state is it'll actually correctly orientate the closest vector to the construction plane and make them nice and straight. So by doing that now, I can see that my rotate, my swing on my shoulder is now going in the right, is, is pointing in the right direction. My swing on the elbow is going to be correct. And the swing on my wrist is now going to be nice and straight. So, and again, the wrist, we can, we can sort of tweak that out a bit if, if we see that's the flattened wrist and we can actually open that one up a bit. And I think that's actually moving the upper arm, and it shouldn't be. Yeah, it is. Should have child, child compensate on. That's better. Hmm. Interesting bug. Um, but uh, we caught it because we saw the bone swing. But anyway, there we go. So that's that's looking good. And do the same thing for the leg, and and then we'll do the fingers. So again. Select these three joints, and then right mouse uh, construction plane. It gets pretty quick. Um, you get pretty quick at it once you start working. Again, same bug, eh? So, I'm sorry, construction plane to selection. I'm sorry, that's better. And now, again, I want to take a look at this knee, and I want to basically Make sure child compensation is on. I'm just going to select the one joint. I think it's what I, I know what the problem is. When I have multiple joints selected, it really doesn't like that. And so we want to rotate that joint so it's roughly like that. And again, the, the limb swing, just make it rough. And then the ankle as well. And it's this case, the my, my x-axis is actually pointing down and I want to make it face roughly in that direction. Now I can select these three joints and then right mouse and snap to construction plane and there we go. Now I've got my nice swing angles there. Now for the hand it gets pretty interesting. Um, um, we might want to try um, one of the options in here which is called orient joints. So reorient joints and what this does is it 
tries to fix the orientation of our joints. And we can see here, even though we've done the skeleton, it sort of flips the ankle on me. It flips the, it flips the toes up. It sort of takes looks at the neighboring points and it tries to do its best guess at how to rearrange the joints. But look at what it does to the hands. I mean, rotating an X because they're sort of, this one sort of flipped will rotate in the wrong direction. So reoriented joints is great for simpler rigs or, or rigs that you create procedurally, such as growing flowers, trees, any sort of organic structures that you're growing outwards, reorient works great. But in this case, it doesn't work too well. We'll just leave that up there and call that not great job here. And back to the skeleton move our display flag and I'll fix one of the fingers and then we'll quickly jump forward and then you can see how quickly this goes for the rest of the fingers and again the nice thing about these is the uh, the x-axis is roughly aligned where I want the fingers to rotate so let's see how, to, how good a job that does in this case I only want to pick three three fingers so let's pick the the knuckle uh, the first joint and I slightly tweak that and then this and then right mouse and then you can see how quickly you can do that. And uh, snap selection to construction plane. And oh, let me snap selection to construction plane. There we go, that works. And I'll do the next finger again. So pick this, this, and this, and then right mouse and say, or right, construction plane, I forgot to add the, the knuckle joint. <laughs> and then snap selection. So really, really quick workflow when we're working on this. And then we'll add our finger joint and then snap selection to construction plane and so on and so forth. So this part of the job is much more pleasurable than it was, is with the old uh, object-based orient. Um, and let's add her and say snap selection to construction plane. And finally, let's work on our thumb. And again, the thumb the rotates are sort of not where I want them. So I want the thumb to sort of curl in. So what I'm going to do is make sure child compensate is on and, uh, again, I, 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 I know what I did. <laughs> I tried using the Y key. It's still not quite used to. So, um, and it still wants to go into the edit state. So I'm just going to hit escape and then enter. And again, select this joint and then right mouse show handle. And I just want to make it so that the rotates roughly in the direction that I want it to be. So that if I do any sort of automatic opening and closing of the hands, they'll all go in the same direction. So I'll pick this and rotate it around. Just close is good enough because it'll choose the closest vector to the construction plane to orient. And then finally just select only three joints here. So right mouse. So I want to make sure orient on snap, orient to construction plane, and then snap selections. And that orient on snap makes it work so well. There we go. So now with the hand all done, um, there's a few other things that we want to do now. And what I'm going to do is right mouse on this construction plane. And basically there's an option in here that allows you to reset this, this construction plane. So, and you can right mouse up here and you can set construction plane with the Y axis. And there we go. And there's a few other options in here. Set construction plane, uh, basically um, center plane on the uh, y-axis. And we're back to where we started. Now we're gonna have a take gonna take a quick look at um, fixing up some of the some of the capturing, for instance, around the jawbone, and I'll show you you can quickly create um, a little rig to, to basically move the jawbone. Um, with joints, unlike bones, um, we're going to find out that there's an interesting uh, dilemma that we have here. And this is why many times you'll see 
uh, rigs from motion capture systems that are joint based, they'll have an additional bone that's parented off the neck that'll come up. Or they'll fork a T off of here, move a joint forward and forward. The reason why is it gives you a free joint to grab and rotate that bone with. Whereas if I grab this joint and I, and I turn off child compensation, which is now behaving like a regular joint, and I rotate this, you can see how we're gonna rotate the head along with the jaw. So we'll take a look and, and see um, um, how we can tackle that problem. So let's move down and move our display back onto the, the bone deform. And we can see that we have a full body IK operator in here, which is a lot of fun um, in this particular rig. Um, you can select the rig pose here. And uh, in this particular case, um, we blasted away everything but just those locators, turning that, just, just extracting locators from the rig. And then we reparent these to nothing. We remove all the, all the parenting information and then we pass these through a rig pose. And then we put these into as, as location constraints into the full body AK, which is set up the physics full body. And back to the bone to form. So now I can press this rig pose and I can start moving this with the various different weights and you can, you can have all kinds of different fun with that. So, yep. grab the hand. There's different ways to control the weights and the hands as well. We want to work on the, we want to work on the jawbone though, because right now the jawbone is uh, just a translation based. Uh, so if we go to the master controller up here, and we pick this jawbone. Not only is the rig sort of, or this jawbone's up here, and uh, we can use a rotation will do nothing because it's an end locator. But if we move this around, you can see that there's a flawed capture on there. So we're going to build this rig at the very end. Our, our jaw rig is going to be applied after all the full body IK um, is being, is, is work is being done. So we can take a look at this. And the one approach we can take is uh, we can do a delete joints. And we're going to extract just that one jaw point. So actually we're going to extract um, the head joint and the jaw bone. You can see here we got the head and the jaw tip. And I'm gonna hit enter, and then we're gonna delete, delete non-selected. So we've now got this joint isolated. And then we can put down a rig pose, and this, this we can use to rotate our jaw. So if we now select this and we rotate this, we can now rotate our jaw. And you'll notice that um, the rig pose getting a little bit more detail into the rig pose. Um, the mode can be done in many different ways. Um, you can pre-multiply, post-multiply overrider from the rest pose. So this gives you complete control as to how you want this tr transform to be applied, either in world space and parent space. or um, And because we only want to do the rotate on this, we can lock off all of these various different parameters lock off the translates and the scales. And what that does is it just limits the degrees of freedom that we have available to us on this. And as I said before, you can bind, uh, um, you know, we took a look at it already where you can bind control geometry. In this case, we're not going to. Um, but we're going to do one more thing. We're, gonna actually, um, we're actually going to uh, delete this anchor point now. So I'm going to put delete another delete joints and uh and we'll see why in a minute we, we have to do this so i'm just going to delete this joint because all i want to do is just drive this one point and uh, we also did up here a skeleton blend as you'll see in the in the tutorial from parker he shows you how to do the skeleton blend and that allows you to blend um, one joint to the other and the attribute we're going to be matching is by name. So again, it's great having the rig tree up. We can actually see the names as we work. So in this particular case, we have delete joints. We have a jaw tip. So if we put down a skeleton blend, um, put that down. And we're now going to wire on where we're basically going into the full body IK. We're going to wire that. We're going to wire this. And then we're going to replace this joint. Oh, didn't want to do that. And we're going to wire this into the third input because that's where we put our our blends and the skeleton blend. Um, let's do the translate and the rotate and the scale. 
and we can remove the decrees of freedom as as we go forward but now if we take a look at this and you can see that the bone is wildly so we only want to do the rotates so we don't want to pick up the translates and the scales because remember it's going to try and apply it in, in world space so, so now if i go to the rig pose and i rotate this you can see now that with the skeleton we actually are rotating that point and so it works quite well and uh, now with the bone deform we can rig this up So again, when we apply all the degrees of freedom of translate, rotate, scale, the skeleton blend can, can, can blend in local space or world space. And because we've extracted the point and there's no parenting hierarchy, uh, there is no local space. So we need to turn this on world space. Again, this single joint has no local position to rotate from. So uh, we set world space on and now we're fine. So if I do the rig pose, and now you can see we can control the jaw, jawbone. And that also means that, um, you know, if we're, when we're building out our rig, all I need to do is just promote this handle up to the top of the rig. And uh, that's how we do our control. So let's put this jaw control. And uh, we might want to have a rotate in X. And you never know. Let's take a look. And if we just turn the rotate thing, you can get a lot. All the degrees of freedom probably make a good sense. So what I want to do now is just quickly paint out some of the areas in the mouse. So let's crank this open and we can now go up to the area where um, we've actually done the capture layer paint. And I already know that some parts before I do any, well, that's actually, I'll show you. Um, there's some points in here that are, that are um, not fused. So if I pull down some points here, you're going to see that the, uh, inner part the mouth bag is not fused to the actual outer skin so if I go to the capture layer paint select this and uh, the capture region I want to paint uh, would be the jaw so the jaw tip is what I want to paint and if I paint this down with an opacity of one you'll see what happens so you can see you tear it off so this Houdini so we can actually put a fuse in here and uh, we can fuse uh, those points in here. Uh, you'll notice the capture layer paint will error out and we'll see why that is in a second but let's actually make this a much smaller distance 0 0.0001 and if we go to the capture layer paint uh, display this um, and error this we can see don't have matching points. It simply is because we already started painting on the geometry and now we changed the point cloud. So there's a couple things that we can do. We can go stroke and we can say um, we can reapply all the strokes, but in this case, um, let's go to this, let's go to brush and let's go to operation. And we're just basically going to reset all changes. And now we're happy again. So it's basically starting from scratch again. You can see some of the contribution from the job, job position. And let's move right back to the bone to form. We can paint in situ. So let's go back up to the capture layer paint and with opacity. So Smooth Final does a pretty good job of cleaning this up. Uh, okay. So I usually set the Smooth Final. Uh, and so basically I just dab it with the left, which is apply some paint, and then you can smooth it out. It's a pretty, pretty good technique. Been using that for many, many years. Doing character rigging. So we're, it's good enough for now. And now we can go back to our jaw control and have a look at what we've got. So it's, it's a start. I mean, it's, it's good. Now, the nice thing about this is um, you, can, um, you can make this quite anatomically correct because once we're in this part of the rig, we can build out whatever bone armature we want just to drive that end jawbone. As we see here, the only thing we're gonna... 
So the only thing that we really care about is this isolate jaw tip joint and uh, anything else we do above here is fair game. So that's one of the great things about this rigging system is you can basically add whatever it is that you want. Now the next thing you want to do finally is add a hand control. So after the skeleton blend we can put down another rig pose and let's see the work that we've done and or fixing all the orientation on our fingers to see if it actually works. Now this is a bit fussy because rig post currently doesn't allow you to do multiple joint selections. So, but every time you select a joint, it actually adds it to the list. So let's start off with the thumb. You can see every time you click it, I'm just going to hold down the shift key and I really wish there was a, there probably is a hotkey or something that allows me to select one of the bones and quickly select all the hierarchy. Let's try that. No. So let's keep on selecting. Almost done. So now that we've selected all the joints, let's, we missed one there. Now we can open and close the hand pretty easy. And again, we can take a look at the Delta Mush version of this. And Oh, the delta mush, I need to be very careful because my delta mush is no longer, because I use the fuse sop, I have to make sure that uh, this is coming from the fuse now because then my joints have, I've changed the point count so delta mush won't be happy. It needs to have everything in the same location. So let's say left hand controls. And in this particular case, I can do that and I can now, open and close the hand if I were to do the, the x-axis, that is. And sure enough, so I was very careful making sure that the x-rotates all work and looking pretty good. Now, if you find one of the fingers overlaps a bit, you might be tempted to fix it up here. But what we can do is we can actually go all the way up. We could fix it in situ if you wanted to, but we can go back all the way up to the skeleton. And if we do it up here, when we mirror the skeleton onto the right-hand side, we get all of that for free. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna pick, pick this right mouse and turn on the show handle. And I just wanna tweak this six or seven degrees, so. Six degrees, that joint. And Actually, let's turn on Child Compensate so we don't pick up the parenting information. And six, and let's pick this joint. And all we're doing is just moving, um, moving that X location. That rotated that joint out a bit so that the finger six degrees and then finally the tip and then we'll take a look at how that finger has corrected itself so this is how we can turn a really quick and easy rig into something that behaves a little bit better um, and so now we can control z let's get back to the rotate we can see now that and for the thumb, if we want the thumb to rotate a little bit slower, what we could do is we could just add a control, add a spare parameter and, and tag all these different parameters to this. So what I'm going to do is add a spare parameter and then I'm going to start copying and pasting. So in here under, say, type properties or pardon me, edit parameter interface. And let's add a spare float and let's put it right up the top here under rest pose. Yeah, that's a good place to put under transformations. Yeah, just above transformations. And let's call this finger close and press accept. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to Oh, I should have actually created a proper range on that. So let's go to the edit parameter interface, a different way to get it this time. And let's say range is minus 10 to plus. Let's try 60 and press accept. 
And now I can just kind of create this channel reference to rotate. And I'm just going to pause and do that with all the channels and then we'll get back. So now I've created channel references to that driver at the top called rest transform where the finger closed. And now when I manipulate that, you can see that we have a nice control on top of that. The thumb is, I want the thumb to close a bit quicker than everything else. So I can actually press on this, this deselect everything plus this jump thumb joint and the hand controls jumps to that. And I want to multiply this by 1.2 or 20%. I want to add an extra 20% to the rotate of this. So the thumb closes a bit sooner than everything else. And let's pick this second joint, same thing. And let's pick the thumb tip, same thing, control V. And now when we do this manipulator, it'll all be fine. So now the thumb will close a bit sooner. So that means if you were to put a hammer or something into his hand, it works great. And of course, you duplicate it for the right-hand side. So that, now we're well on our way to doing um, more perfecting of the rig and cleaning it up and uh, uh, sort of the standard rig operations you would be doing day in and day out. So the final section I want to take a look at with KineFX is constraints. Um, constraints are how you take two joints and you build a relationship between them. Um, we have several constraints that we ship with Houdini and they're all um, centered inside of VOPS. We have a look at constraint, a parent constraint, a path constraint, a surface constraint, and a blend transforms constraint. But that's not stopping you from building any of your own constraints inside of VOPS or using attribute wrangles which are essentially um, building the same thing. Uh, sometimes you like code, sometimes you like uh, using operators. But anyway, we're gonna have a look at the look at constraint because it uh, to start off with to see how you actually get in there and how you work with these things. And um, there's really good um, notes in C inside of the documentation. So you can see a look at constraint, um, how you set these things up, and how you work inside of KineFXO. Um, and there's some really nice examples in here that make it pretty straightforward. So if you're an expert Houdini user and you just wanna get into this really quickly, just have to have a quick look at this, uh, at this page, read through it. And also CG Wiki has some interesting things on using constraints. I'm not really called out directly, but um, you can find a, a look at uh, local constraints here if you, Take a look at uh, the floating parent constraint example, and uh, they cover a bit of that as well. But let's go back to the constraint documentation and documentation. Have a look at creating a simple look at constraint. So now let's have a quick look at a look at constraint. Um, so again, in the technical desktop and uh, paint tab, animation, rig tree. If you really don't want to do this all the time, you can actually save this as a new desktop <laughs> so that way. Um, that's what I've done. Um, but moving forward, so the rig tree, and again, if you're in build, just, just unstow the right and add it there. So let's add a piece of geometry, geometry container. Let's call this, um, look at constraints and dive inside. Now you might see there, there's some really good examples. If you take a look at the help card for the look at, it shows you uh, quite a complex setup where you can use a look at constraint to constrain a camera. Uh, many times we just want to have like a couple pairs of eyes looking at something. So we just want to know the basics of, of how to do a look at constraint. And for that, I'm going to actually go back to my assets, install asset library. And I just really like my, my asset. So I'm going to go to the locator install and I'll show you why I really like it. It's, it's just a really handy way of, I mean, you could use a skeleton saw or use, then you have to use add ops and everything else that goes on top of it. But I just like this locator and let's call this, um, root and let's I'll drag out and let's call this up vector. And let's drag this out and let's call this guy look at, or let's call it target. Let's move these around. So 
let's move the up vector up and let's change it to a box and change its scale down and let's go to the root and let's change its control scale down a bit and I actually want to turn it to uh, nulls and planes and let's click at the XY plane because I want to put my look at down the Z axis and that's my target so let's move this target out of it and let's move it up and so and let's label the target yellow and uh, let's make it spheres or circles and reduce the scale a bit as well and you can build out your own hierarchy as to what look at or you can pair this to a, a space locator in world remember joints are always in world space but we fall but we do keep tabs of the local transformations so there's my my setup now we're going to use um you you think you would be using the attribute vop but the attribute vop is a completely different animal this is what you don't want to use there's a rig attribute vop and this is quite a bit different than the attribute vop um, architecturally speaking inside the attribute vop we've built out a really nice uh, workflow um, that goes beyond what regular VOPs can do. Plus, we've ported a lot of the chop constraints as as VEX operators as, as and exposed them as VOPs. So I want to take both my root and my up vector wired right into the left input because that's what I usually the general convention is what it is that we are modifying goes into the first input and then the other inputs is where we put references. Uh, in this case, we want to bring that in as a second input as a reference. And let's dive inside. Now, let's start off with a look at. Now, there's two look ats that we need to concern ourselves with. There's the original look at VOP, but that is for just building a regular vector. It has nothing to do with kin effects. There's got two there's look at kin effects and a look at constraints. So let's add the look at kin effects and let's actually add the look at constraint. Why is there no kinney effects there? I don't know, but the icon should give you a good idea that it's for kinney effects. So let's do a look at constraint. So we have two of them. Now these use signatures. If you don't know what signatures are, basically it allows us to, based on how we input into these uh, slots, um, the type will determine the layout. So we can actually have vector inputs or matrix inputs. Um, and the same thing for this one, matrix or vector as well. So we can actually put vectors in here. But remember uh, that three by three transform attribute that's present on all kinney effects points play very nicely with this default transform. But if you have points that are using like a normal and an up vector, you can use those as well. Or if you have quaternions on them, you can crack the quaternions into the vectors that you need or to a three by three matrix transform. Or you can even use a four by four matrix and just, uh, um, you know, um, re, 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 recast it into a three by three and it does all the right things inside of ops and I digress now when we're working in this viewport here through the rig attribute bop this is going to evolve moving into the next release and the release after that into something that is going to be really really special so treat this as a little bit different than what the attribute bop does for instance if I right mouse on here if I, first of all, if I hit escape, I get the view state. And if I hit the right mouse button, I'm going to get all the view tools. But if I hit enter, while I'm in this workflow and I don't have my viewport pinned, I'm actually looking through the VOPs. If I right mouse on here, um, we have all of these very cool options. We have enable output, so we can actually disable and enable the output. This is more for debugging to see uh, what it is that this VOP network is doing because this can sometimes be very misleading or not giving you updates when it actually is giving you updates. Um, so we have enable up, enable input one, enable input two, enable input three, and enable input four. Basically, it's basically muting. I think of it as the other way, instead of enable mute. So it makes more sense to me. I want to mute input three, so you basically turn that off, or mute input four, you turn that off. Um, some other things, we can get point transform, we can set point transform. Um, so um, we can also display the inputs and turn the inputs off. Now notice that uh, the left input is what's driving the values. Um, there's also display joint axes, 
display links if we want to. Uh, so we can actually see the links. Let's leave the links on and we can actually show joint data if we really want to be on the joint data. Now, when you hover over joint, you'll see something really interesting. We actually show two entries. We show root, and then we show root up vector. And if we go to the tree view, we notice that the input into this operator is the up vector operator. Because remember, we put those two nulls. So this means um, pretty interesting. So the root is what we want to read and write to. So if, if you have two entries on here, it means that there's two possible selections. There's basically the selection that's coming into me, and then there's the selection that I wish to write to. So if I press on this, you can see we show it the two dots. Now, if I drag this upper dot that has the up vector on it, I'm actually going to get that point transform. But I've hover over this and I go the root, and I, and I basically pick this point again. It's two clicks, by the way. You click first time, and then the second one is you can drag out the root. If I drag out the root, that's what I'm writing to. I've done this so many times now, it's, it's uh, pretty standard. I, I actually love this. Now, if we click on here, we can see there's the up vector coming in and the up vector going out. I obviously want to write that into the lookup, so I want to get that value, so I click and then drag. Now. As I'm doing this, I want to take this transform and wire it from the from, transform to the to. Or pardon me, that's the up. What am I doing? And then finally, here's my target. Notice the target, because the second input isn't writing to output data, we only have the one option, so you can just directly click and drag that in. Again, because it's not part of the first input what you're writing to or not exporting this, um, we sh only show the input points coming in. That's why that doesn't show that hierarchy. If we were writing to the second input, we'd actually see those two options as well. And again, this is the transform that we're using to the two. And let's rearrange this a bit so it makes a bit more sense. And then what we need to do is there's the points that are currently being modified. Many times you need to worry about this, but uh, um, um, in this particular point, this will actually work just the way it is. And you can see right away, right away when we do the transform, because the transform is a three by three, it holds both translates, rotates, and scales. Um, it immediately gives us our update. And you notice that our up vector is a little bit cropped. Um, so, and that's because we're looking at the output transform. Um, but it, we also have to look at axes all along. So now we've got to sort of put on our hat and we say, well, the up vector should be in the Y axis, which is the way that I modeled it. So we need to turn the up vector to the Y axis. And look at, I always like going down the Z axis, but you might be working with a rig environment or a rigger that uh, uses a different application and then they have a different, uh, uh, different preferences in the way they rig. But in Houdini, it's minus Z is the look at and uh, Y is up. So I'm just setting those up by default, but you can change these however you want. You can actually have negative Y, X, Y, or you can actually have the, you can change all these different planes around. So if, if you can do the artist rigger thing and just cherry pick until you get the right axes. But in general, I like to do minus Z down the look at and Y is the up. And that's the way I rig. And it's working. So if I now go up and I go to the target and sure enough, you just get your basic look at. Pretty straightforward. And that's it. So that's it. That's the basic atomic look at constraint. Um, and you can build it out as complex as you want. Um, now, be wary that there is a rig uh, attribute wrangle SOP as well. It doesn't give you this environment. Only the VOPS environment gives you this really nice environment to look at. Now, again, we can do the same thing with the look at constraint down here, and I'll show you the simple difference here. Um, here's look at and then look up. What am I doing? And we can wire it, and we can actually put a switch in here because I know the two are going to work. Put a switch in here. And again, signatures on a lot of these VOPs will automatically uh, reset the signature. And then we can go to switch one. Now, the nice thing about going to the second look at constraints, we actually have a blend as well. So um, many of these constraints have um, a lot of uh, work. And the second one is pretty interesting. Uh, many times when we're working, in, and this is also something quite unique to the rig attribute VOP versus the regular attribute VOP, 
is we've added the ability to stash a transform. So many times when you're in SOPs, you know, or in object space, you know, you can actually uh, freeze transforms. And what that does is it creates, um, uh, it writes the pre-transform of the object. So we have the same concept inside of ops, which is what the update offset is. Uh, basically, update offsets basically takes your parameters and then bakes it into the operator so it zeroes everything out. And now when we do the blend, now it says, okay, fine, I want to freeze the current position with my look at in its new position. But now I can go back up again and I can go back to this target and I can now start animating it and I get my look at. So that's how you can freeze things. Subtle, but extraordinarily important. And if you're, if you're an existing Houdini user coming into the rig attribute, you go, wow, <laughs> so the update offset. And I'll show you where that is. I'm gonna crack this open, allow it any of contents. For the more technical Houdini users, nothing is black box in here. Double click inside of this. And we actually have this ability to stash uh, transforms inside of here now, which is pretty cool. And uh, where did we put that? Um, yeah, so it's the driver. It's in the stash transform uh, vop that we added. So if you want to build your own, and by the way, I'm inside this operator, and you can actually see how we build these various constraints. As I said at the very beginning of this constraints lecture, we give you four or five to work with. You can create as many as you want. I've created some pretty wacky uh, geometry-based constraints, which I want to cover in smaller one-off uh, videos So um, beyond this Illum. So I basically, I just want to illuminate what's actually here for you to dig in. So yeah, dive in. Uh, we have these great stash transforms. A lot of these constraints and set of ops use these stashes. And again, to replicate this behavior that you have at the object level when you using pre-transforms. You know, you can click on the stash transforms and you want to zero out the values. Or you basically want to say, no, no, why is it when I do my look at with my aim constraint, I want it up to begin with and I just want to stash that and it resets your transform. So it behaves very much like a pre-transform that you apply. And, you do, and many of them will do pre or post. So there's a driver in this particular asset, there's a driver and there's a driven uh, cache transform as well. Just so you know, there's no mystery there. That's where we're writing this. And I'm going to say match current definition to this. So you can actually clear the offset again, or you can update the offset now. And uh, yeah, so you can move your look at where you want it to go, where you want it to be, and then you do update the offset. And it just basically calculates that offset to reset your, your uh, look at. And that's a brief look at con constraints. So I want to look at one final constraint setup, and that's looking at the IK solver. One of the things that we've done in KineFX, as I mentioned before with the constraints, is we've um, ported over all of the chop constraints. And the critical one is the IK solver. So let's have a look at the IK solver. And this is a little bit of a reaction video. I noticed that uh, a couple of the users that were recording videos built custom rigs to sort of solve the, the T-Rex um, inverse kinematics um, type of a leg where you have, uh, um, you have uh, the rear leg also has the, the you know, uh, creatures tend to walk on their toes and their ankle is, is what's actually being supported. It's a sprung system. So I got this trick from an old friend who actually worked on um, the, the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park 2, 3, and 2 and 3. And uh, so this was going way back when we were working on the wild. And I'm going to show you the T-Rex leg setup and what the chop solver could do because it's a direct port we could now also do with the regular solver so we should be able to do three bone or four joint ik as a special case so i'll show you that rig right now so first thing i want to do is uh, let's add a skeleton and i'm going to try my best so you can see here i've already added the rig tree view um, and i'm in the technical desktop uh, which I've modified, so the skeleton. And now what I want to do is I want to rob the leg loan, uh, pardon me, the, the femur to be exactly the same as the ankle bone, the same angle. Um, I've got a rig that actually draws this one second, it copies it over and then connects the two lines and builds the rig. But let's see if we can do this by doing something like that. So I'm going to click on, so I'm in the skeleton SOP, escape, enter, and I got snapping on. 
Oh, and let's go to create. I'm sorry. And um, it's grid snapping on. And let's drag it from there. And I'm going to grab a leg to go to there. And then drag that leg there. And then go down to here. So I'm going to try and draw two parallel leg bones like that. Um, they don't have to be, as long as this bone is parallel to this one, I'm okay. And the closer you are to parallel, the better the T-Rex leg will work. Um, so that's why I literally draw this one joint, copy it over, and then connect the two. But having drawn the skeleton, now we're going to put down a rig pose. And the, we want to basically have this one point and this one point. So we want to do a delete joints. And in the delete joints, uh, we're going to go here. We're going to select this point and this point and hit enter. And we're going to delete non-selected. And so there we go, delete non-selected. And as well, we want to do a reparent just to get rid of that uh, primitive link. So we have a reparent. All it really does is deleting. We, you know, we could do an edge dissolver, but I don't think that would work very well. We can do reparents and we can just say start to null. And that will get rid of that link for us. So now we have two end effectors. And of course, we can copy control geometry to this by using the attached control geometry operator that we saw in that add, that add, that locator swap I did. But now we're going to put down a rig attribute VOP. And let's take a look at the kinematic solver. So I'm going to wire this in. I'm going to wire the second boot into the joint and move my display flag. There's going to be some funkiness. I'm going to show you some of the funkiness that you're going to end up with. So we have an IK solver. Now the IK solver is can solve any number of joints. And what I had, what we have added, one of the developers in the KinFX team did for me because I did some forensic analysis between once I realized that it was the same solver, I started building uh, the same rigs and I was noticing that that was getting flipping, which is exactly what I saw from one of the videos for technical rigging that I seen out there. And, uh, they were doing this exceptional rig where they're doing two, two point IK and they're doing it by, and they're doing all kinds of expressions. And I'm going, no, no, <laughs> the, the, I know what our solver can do. So, and I'll show you that rig in a minute, but I'll show you this really quick setup. So to solve IK. So basically what we want to do is we want to do um, set uh, transforms. So set point transforms. Now you'll notice there's two. Set point transform is when we want to drive a single point one at a time. But we also have this option to set point transforms. And that means you can see here if I hover over X forms, it's actually a matrix array. That's what that matrix A, that matrix A stands for. The A stands for uh, array. And you'll notice that it's a darker tint. So I'm going to drive that into the transforms. And the solve IK, um, target points, root goal, and twist. We don't have a twist on there, so I'm just going to remove the twist. And right away, you'll see, um, you'll get a really odd result here. And um, you can see that this node, I don't even need to create any inputs. It's already smart enough to figure out that if I have the two wires in and I've built everything correctly with name matching up, the default target ID and root gold twist IDs will match up perfectly for me. So I don't even have to monkey around with any of the, you know, uh, any of the get point transforms um, over here. But we will have to worry about that in a bit. Um, but we have this option now here that was that was added for me from recent builds. I'm using build uh, 596. So it will be in that build. So we can actually go here, compute from targets. And uh, yeah, so um, we're getting closer. And all we need to do is just turn up the twist flag. And then now we get the right, the right uh, setup because I'm not supplying a twist effector. Um, I don't, I, you have to turn the twist flag off. Now we have no wrist angles. That's the solve that uh, we're used to seeing. And this is the corrected solve. We have a second option called compute from rest transforms. And I'll show you that one right now, because that's even more interesting. Cause many times with the T-Rex leg, if you have a character that's flipping or the leg is going past the pole and it starts getting unstable, you can actually use a, a set 
type driven key where we can tie in the rest transforms with the regular transforms. But let's first of all see how this behaves when we set it to just compute from targets. In other words, it's looking at the targets here to compute the range. So we go to rig pose here and we start moving that into factor. Sure enough, we get a really nice behavior and we can get our critter walking as it goes. And now it behaves the way it should without actually having to do an exceptional rig. And because these two joints are parallel, they stay roughly parallel as you move. And if I was even closer to being parallel, you'd actually get perfect result that way. So now we got our T-Rex leg. Boom, 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 boom. And the multi ik solver works fine. And that works great for also doing multi-joint limbs, three or four bone joint limbs as well will work a lot better with this technique. So thankfully this correction was put in there so now we can actually fully explore all the possibilities that we have in the old CHOP IK solver, which is now ported over inside of here as a solve IK. But now let's add uh, a hint to um, to the way that we can work on the, you know, on the skeleton. We're going to add a third input now. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a skeleton blend. And we're going to blend between two different states so we can actually drive um, the skeleton. So we're going to put this over to here and I'm going to put another rig pose. And this rig pose will allow us to actually sculpt the rest position for our IK solver. And, uh, and then I can uh, take the skeleton blend and uh, I'm going to put a null in here just so we can clearly identify what this is. And I'm going to adjust rest there we go and to wire this in into the third input and you can see right away that uh, it's kind of cool here that we're seeing two rigs now um, if I right mouse on here though because this rig attribute VOP is doing something special with the display and if you find this disconcerting you think oh no who has got that bug where it's drawing jump tree that's not supposed to be drawing not the case here you have to right mouse and we're actually showing you all the inputs and the outputs as well. So we can actually turn this option off here called display inputs. So we can only see the result of this operator. So that's that's part of the magic of working with the rig attribute VOP. As I said, it's going to get even more special as we go to the next release and the release after that. But if we double click inside of here now, we can actually put a get point transforms. And we're going to pick up all the trans because we have here rest transforms. So we can supply our own rest transforms on the fly and actually is a matrix A as well. So we'll get transforms and we want to get it from the third input and we can wire that into the rest transforms. And now um, if I go back to here and we can now say compute from rest transforms and now we can actually customize what those transforms are going to look like. And uh, so if we go to the rig pose here and we can now move this, we can now hint we can actually edit the rest pose on the fly by going to the second rig pose and we can tweak the rest positions and this can all be animated. So if we want to drive this, this joint rig such that if the leg is doing some wonky things in the really exceptional situations, we can put a re relationship between this rig pose and that rig pose to sort of keep things in harmony if we're getting some odd results, which is something we could do with, uh, with the, with, the, um, the object-based rigs as well, um, which is quite, quite handy. So now we can do the rig pose here and we get our nice uh, rig for doing the binding. And I said before I'd show you an example file, so I have one here off to the side. I've built a number of these files where I build the chain because we need to make sure that we're, we're doing good work here. So I'm just going to turn this guy off here. Um, so I actually built the rig and objects using the old uh, uh, IK kin shop and you can see here there's uh, pretty much everything we have the blend in there which is what I exposed with that blend for the IK solver so this is exactly what we ported over to and we can see here if we take the chain goal here and we move this leg I can actually make this leg move and it works uh, quite well and now if I go inside of here which is it's kind of a cool setup what I did here is I have my skeleton. I built it exactly from, I snapped to the points in the original bone, rig pose, skeleton blend, and rig attribute. And over here, I'm merging in the actual control rig from the objects themselves with the rig pose so I can actually adjust things beyond what I can do at the object level. And there's my rig attribute VOP. 
again set up the same way solve ik to set point transforms so if i go up here and now if i move the chain goal and i turn the display of these guys off off i can actually see my four point uh, chain bone is doing exactly what it was doing and this one i am very careful to make sure that these two are parallel so now i get the exact same solution with uh, the new uh, vop kinfx workflow versus the old chop workflow this is just reinforcing the fact that we are porting a lot of the chops channel operators that we used in previous rigs into this new kinematic solver so hopefully if you're an existing video td who's done some rigging you're going oh really so the expectations are that we are matching uh, when we port these things over from chops into the new um, rig VOP context that they actually behave the same. So please test that out and if you find any clerical errors or any sort of discrepancies, please report them to, to us. But anyway, there you go. Um, yeah, I'll provide all these files. Uh, thank you.